Hello, everybody. Today, we are going to be doing an art school portfolio critique, looking at a portfolio by Catherine Chung. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't afford an art class, we've got everything you need here at Art Prof, critiques, tutorials, and professional development. What I think is so great about Catherine's portfolio, there is a massive range of different types of materials, subject matter, and also in terms of styles, which I'm really happy to see because too often I'm meeting a lot of high school students who are very worried that they don't already have a really well-defined artistic style. And at that stage in your artistic development, you really should not have a style. And so what I'm seeing here in Catherine's portfolio is just a wonderful range of experimentation, trying out so many different ways of articulating an image. There is a 3D piece. There are several mixed media artworks. There's a print. There are pieces that are clearly done from life, pieces that are done from photographs. And also there are means of drawing in this portfolio that are very gestural and very fast paced. But then there are also pieces here that demand a huge amount of detail and focus and attention to create. There are also pieces that feel a lot more spontaneous and a lot more impulsive. And so I just think that is wonderful that Catherine is capturing that much of a range of different ways of working. I think a lot of people are afraid to do that. I think a lot of high school students are worried that they're gonna lose their voice if they try too many different things. But actually I have to say it's the opposite. I always tell students that the way to really develop your own artistic style is to try as many styles as you possibly can. And Catherine has done an excellent job of doing that. Now, I think one of the things I would consider in this portfolio is how to balance all the various pieces that are happening in an individual artwork. So for example, a lot of these pieces have very complicated scenes. I mean, this piece, there are so many objects, there's a shelf, there's a sink, and also you've got three point perspective going on in here. It makes for a very complicated, very exciting scene but there are just so many parts to that scene that I think oftentimes in some of these compositions, it's hard to know where we're supposed to be looking. And so what I would say as the artist, you have to think about yourself almost like a movie director, like there's so much happening on a movie set. But the thing is, it's up to you to really tell people what's important, what's less important, what can stay behind, who needs to become more prominent? Because I think in a piece like this, which shows a lot of technical skill with the colored pencil, it's very detail oriented. All of that is really well done. But the thing is, you've got so many pieces and so many details that I'm actually not really sure what I'm supposed to look at. And so what happens is that you're basically rendering every part of this drawing in the exact same way. So everything in the drawing almost feels like it's at an equal level of importance. And the thing is, if you make everything, quote, important, all of a sudden, none of it's important because everything's too much the same. So what I would really recommend is trying to take an approach where you're really thinking about, hey, what is the balance between all of these pieces? This piece, I think, is doing a much better job because there's the loud part of this piece, which is these wrinkles that are in the rice paper and they're very expressive and very bold. But then there are these like tiny, tiny little trees that are in the waterfall going down. And those are so small, you can almost miss them. And then the top of the piece is very, very light and airy and almost ethereal. And so that's a great range because certain parts of this piece are shown to be more important, bolder than other sections. Whereas I think a piece like this, there's so many components, the two figures, the piano keys, the piano board, the floor, 
And areas like the floor, which aren't really that critical in this narrative, are just as dark and just as emphasized as some of the areas, say, the piano keys and in the figure. So it's almost like you've got too much of a good thing. Just because you can render something to a full out degree of detail, it doesn't mean you should. So for example, this is a really dynamic composition. I love all the different shapes and diagonals that are crisscrossing throughout the entire page. But the thing is, I don't really know what you think is more important because the sandwich is just as detailed as the roses, as that table and the top upper left corner as the table. And so it's almost like you need to look at the different pieces of your compositions. And it's like, you almost have to rank them. Like you have to say the sandwich is the most important thing. Then the roses and actually the chairs are not very important. You have to show me that balance. Because the thing is, all the different parts of this portfolio, all the little pieces of each painting, they're all beautifully done. It's not the parts. The issue is how you put those parts together. How do those parts actually develop and support each other as a group? Because if you have a group of people, you can't have a group of five people and have five people be the leader. That doesn't work. In terms of dynamics, you would totally cancel each other out. So that's how you have to start to think about your drawings is that not every part of the drawing can be the leader. You have to start to assign those kinds of roles because I think what happens, you don't have a lot of areas in your drawings where there are quiet spaces, places where my eye can rest. You start to do it in this one. In the upper right-hand corner, there's this larger, darker shape that starts to become that. I still think it's a little bit too busy, but especially in this linoleum block, you've got this bold shape of the wolf, but the thing is it's been cut up into so many little pieces and details that we lose the boldness of that form. And then some of the fur in the wolf, it starts to mingle with these figures that are happening in the blue ink. And then everything just starts to really compete for my attention. So I would recommend really trying to think hard about shape because shape is one of those things. It's so simple that a lot of people just don't even think about it. And it's a lot easier to get sucked into details because details are oftentimes the parts of the drawing that really impress people. You'll often hear people say, wow, that drawing is so good. It's so detailed. And so a lot of people tend to invest a lot of weight and attention on details for that reason. But the thing is, details aren't really going to help you very much if there's too many of them and you don't have an underlying shape to keep them organized. And so what you could do, say, for example, in this drawing is pick a couple parts where you don't need that detail and just color over it so they become this more simple, basic shape. I mean, basically, you're in a good situation in that I would rather somebody have too much going on in their piece than not enough. Because when people don't have enough going on in their artworks, it's tougher because it's not very clear what to add. What I'm telling you, Catherine, is that you got too much going on and we have to start taking away some of those things so that the parts of the drawing that you do want to emphasize, that they really shine that they're not being drowned out by all the noise of all the other details, because not everything can be that level of importance. You've got to have a couple of areas that really sink back into the piece a little bit more. I think another thing I would recommend is in terms of keeping that balance and being willing to have more quiet areas. I think if you are drawing or painting to use a tool that is blunter than you want it to be. For example, every time I have taught introductory painting, one of the things that I tell students to do is when you begin a painting, start with a really big brush, a brush that is so wide that it makes you uncomfortable, that it makes you think, oh, I could never paint with this. It's too big, it's too klutzy. But the thing is, that's exactly what you need in the beginning of a painting. And usually when people paint with a really small brush to start with, they're not really painting, they're more drawing with a brush. And that's a very different experience than learning how to paint. And so I think if you start using drawing materials 
like say soft pastels or oil pastels and you paint with a brush that's too big, it's gonna keep you from going for those details too soon because your ability to articulate these details, it's actually a curse and a blessing. You're so good at it that you tend to rely on it too much. And so then you don't think about the composition and the balance of those shapes as much as you can. I also think it'd be a really good idea for you to explore topography. And the reason why is because you do have this one piece towards the end with this National Geographic cover. And what I'm seeing in the title, it's called Left to Burn. I'm going to guess that it is some statement about animals being mistreated, something about fires, and you've got National Geographic. The National Geographic, the text is so small that it's actually very hard to read. And I almost feel looking at this composition that you're trying to hide it from me. And the thing is, if you're going to have text in the piece, like let us see the text. Also, if you're going to use a well-known publication like Time Magazine or Rolling Stone, National Geographic, a lot of that topography is so well known, like people really know what to expect. And so it's awkward if you don't use exactly what they use, because for National Geographic, this yellow border is so iconic, people can really identify that. But then it becomes strange to have the magazine title be so small and also to have none of the other text that typically is on the cover. So what I would say is if you're going to do a magazine cover, really be accurate about the way this cover would look if, in theory, you really truly did have an illustration on there because I think anything other than that is going to come across as flaky and not very well seen through to the end. And then I would also say in your artworks, it'd be nice to see more variation stylistically in a piece. And that's where I think this piece is a great example because there's almost like three different styles of articulation here. You've got the wrinkled rice paper, those very tiny, delicate trees in the water, and then this very thin wash at the top section of the drawing. And that's a beautiful intersection of three very different techniques. This piece really feels like it's just all the same. Colors the same everywhere. The articulation's the same everywhere. Same level of detail. It gets boring very fast. And so think about how you can make a drawing and surprise us. Don't let us look at a drawing and look at another space and say, oh, I know exactly what that's gonna look like. It's gonna look just like that. Even this drawing, which I do think has a wonderful sense of movement and gesture to it, it is the same movement throughout. So for example, if you have this very fast rhythmic pace on the left-hand side, why not have the piece on the right-hand side be very quiet and very slow? so that there's contrast, because it almost feels like once we've seen the image on the left, we don't really need the image on the right because it's almost saying the same thing. So find a way to make us feel surprised that we don't look at your piece and say, oh, I already know what that's gonna look like because that's predictable. You want your audience to feel surprised by that. All right, let's start by looking at each piece individually. I think it's wonderful that you have a 3D piece. I think one of the best parts of your 3D piece is that your craftsmanship is really impeccable. I look at this piece and I really can't see a lot as far as the way it was constructed. There's no glue showing, the pieces seem very solid, and it does have a really wonderful sense of gravity in that some parts of the sculpture almost feel like they're defying gravity. Some areas feel more firmly planted. And so there's this wonderful dynamic motion. And also the fact that you have all this negative space. I mean, it's sort of this variation of these different triangles. There's a lot of overlap. That I think is really nicely done. I think what I would like to see though is way more contrast in terms of scale. Because if we take a look at the rectangles that are spread throughout this composition, they're all about the same. Some of them are a little bit bigger, but not by a lot. I would love to see a couple triangles in here that are say five times the size of one of these. Have a triangle that's the height of the entire sculpture and have a few more in there. I think you really have to broaden the range of scale 
Scale is so important when you're working three-dimensionally. And especially if you look at the different views, you'll notice that the sculpture doesn't offer you that different of an experience from view to view. And I think that's what you want to be looking for in a 3D sculpture is a different experience depending on the view. Now, the view on the left in this slide and this slide, they're pretty much the same. I'm not really learning anything new about that. And so I would just really be turning this piece around a lot. That's one thing you have to do when you work with sculpture. You can't stay in one place and look at it from one point of view for longer than about 10 minutes. You have to keep rotating it, keep reevaluating and making sure that you're giving people a new experience because otherwise it's similar to the drawings that, oh, well, if one side looks like this and they all look like that, then I don't really need to bother engaging with the other sections. If you look at great sculptures, you'll notice that it's just a very different experience from side to side. This is one of my favorite pieces in the entire portfolio for many reasons. For one thing, the fact that you're tackling three-point perspective is amazing. There's a couple spots where the perspective's a little bit bad, but you know something? I'm actually not that bothered by it because of the style with which you painted this. It's a very grungy, sort of dirty looking space. And so for that reason, I don't have the expectation that this is going to be like a really clean, very perfectly rendered linear perspective space. So you're getting away with it, which is absolutely wonderful. And I think that the range of different surfaces is absolutely outstanding. And that's really because of the adjusted collage, the recycled magazines, adding the newsprint. And also this piece has a very good sense of value that the whole right-hand side is pretty dark. You reserve more of the brighter yellows to the left-hand side, and you've got some beautiful white highlights. Like actually one of my favorite parts is this paper towel holder. Nobody would think that a paper towel holder could be that engaging. And yet this one has such a almost drip to it. Like it really feels like it's hanging downwards. And I feel like I know what kind of space this is. I feel like I know that this is a dirty, dungy, messy kitchen. It's got a lot of character and personality. It's very believable. Even this little tray down here, it just looks like it's stuffed with dishes and spoons and all kinds of things. And then seeing the sheen of this pot versus these cast iron pots, I mean, just a gorgeous range of depth. And it's it's a piece that feels very heavily layered, like there's just so much built onto the surface. You've created a very satisfying experience in that way that I don't look at this piece and wish you did more here or wish this was brighter, wish this was more. It just feels very, very full and very rich. On top of that, the unusual shape that you have, I think is wonderful. I think it fits the subject very well because it's a very gritty, almost primitive shape that you've put together. But that to me perfectly pairs what's happening with the subject matter here. And color wise, I do love this patch of blue. In terms of color, I would say maybe a little bit too much yellow. For example, you may want to make the sink be a more noticeably different color. I don't think it's problematic, but I do notice how good this area of blue is. And it makes me wish that the sink was maybe another variation, like maybe it was like a little bit green or maybe it was a little bit purple, whatever you want to do. But I do really love the way that this pops. It really calls attention to that. I'm glad this is a linoleum block because very few people have printmaking in their art school portfolios. But I think design wise, it's one of your weaker pieces. I think for one thing, you've got too many little pieces of shapes. And the other thing is that you've removed so much of this background that it actually makes what does show of the rectangle a little bit confusing because like this area at the bottom is so clearly that rectangular shape that we expect to see with a print. And then to totally remove that border up here, I think feels a little bit awkward. So I might recommend either getting rid of this border altogether so you lose the whole rectangular shape or you could always do another one. I sort of feel like you carved too much from this image and I'm craving like a, a nice like big bold shape that's inked. 
because in here I can see you've got all these figures and there's definitely something happening here, but it's very cluttered and I have a lot of trouble trying to make sense of the piece. And then I don't think necessarily that the color combination is very well thought through, at least right now. I don't see a very compelling reason why you have to have the two colors. What I would try is making sure one of the colors is a lot lighter because you have this brown color, which is pretty dark. It's verging on being black. But the thing is, this blue color is still pretty dark. And at least some of the areas where you've got overlap, where the brown overlaps some of the blue, that's such a wonderful effect you can get in linoleum printmaking. When one color goes on top of another, you can get beautiful overlaps. But here, it's almost like you're trying to get them to not overlap. And that, I think, is a missed opportunity for really considering how to use the material. So I like that as a print. But the thing is, as an image, it's one of your weaker pieces in the portfolio. So I'm not sure I would include it. I mean, linoleum printmaking is challenging. But I think what I would try to do is embrace the technique a little bit more. For example, sometimes people don't like it when you can see little bits left over from the carving because they think, oh, that looks messy. But actually, I love it when woodcuts and linoleum blocks have that because to me, it's like a signature of that material. It's an inherent physical property that we associate with woodcut and linoleum cut. And I think to remove it entirely you're sort of losing that characteristic that we associate so strongly with that material. I love these pieces. I'm going to guess that they're made from life. It seems like somebody reading, somebody watching TV, somebody relaxing, and I think that's wonderful. I don't think enough people draw from life. I mean, drawing from life is not what it used to be. Sorry to sound like an old fart, but when I was a kid, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have cameras that were so, in, that were so accessible and so easy to use. And so we drew from life a lot more. And I think today, drawing from life is the exception. I think it's rare for people to draw from life. And these have a lot of energy, a lot of looseness to them. And I really feel like you did a great job articulating the cheekbones, the chin, even the clothing is so dynamic. I love the experimentation with the watercolor that some areas are tighter, some areas are very loose. So good for you for doing these quick sketches. I don't know that I like that these are cut out. I think it's a little bit awkward. You might want to tear these so you have a softer edge and then collage them together on a single page. Because I can see up here, this is like a little piece left over from a sketchbook. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, I think, matching that against these cleanly cut edges doesn't look great. So you might maybe do a couple more of these life drawings, rip them up and really think about them as a collage that you're gonna to put together into a composition. I really like the motion in this piece, but I do think that you need to increase either the way you're handling your charcoal or your tools. Because I think that often what I see with charcoal is a lot of people don't realize how many tools are available for working with charcoal. For example, using charcoal powder, using charcoal pencil, even using a razor blade. You can go back in and cut towards the drawing to make more textures. I do feel as far as tone goes, the value, it really does feel like there's only three tones. I feel like there's the dark tone, the sort of middle gray and the highlight. And I wish that there was a broader variation of value in here. I don't know what kind of charcoal you're using, but I'm going to guess that the charcoal you're using is not really that dark. There are certain brands that are a lot more powerful than others, but really, if you get a good brand of compressed charcoal, you should be able to get a black that is like a black, like pits of Tataris black is what you should be able to get. I'm not totally seeing that here. So you may take a look at some other brands, see if you can get something better. And then I think I wouldn't be afraid to get more harsh, make some marks that really feel like they bite the paper. Everything feels a little bit too soft and it's okay to have some soft areas, but the thing is it does have that monotonous feeling. And that's why I was saying, if you take 
a razor blade and you just like literally cut up the paper. I know that sounds scandalous to do that to your drawing, but it may give you the depth of texture that is otherwise lacking right now. This is one of my less preferred pieces in the portfolio, just because it is more typical of what I usually see from a high school student working in colored pencil. There are a lot of cliches, I think, typical approaches to certain subjects, and we do have a stream on art cliches, and this one sort of falls down into that. It would be the hyper-detailed colored pencil, very rendered, the face and reflection that's also very common. You can certainly use this piece. I just think if you use it, I would really change your strategy. And you can totally work on this more. This piece is not a piece that you can't really bring back to something more interesting. What I would try to do is cut back on all of those little itty bitty tiny lines. Like pick one part of this piece to be the main event. Maybe the main event is this faucet. So maybe everything else needs to get a lot darker, a lot softer. It's like you just need to cut back on all those tiny little details, make it a lot more subtle. And then you might have something that doesn't feel so much like a cliche by a high school artist. Love this piece. The only thing I would say that I would fix is I would love more value. So I would say maybe down here towards the bottom, it'd be wonderful to get some like deep, dark, like ultramarine, blues, maybe some illusion crimson down there because articulation wise and in terms of texture and style, I love it. It's just that the value range is fairly limited. You've got some darks, but they're all pretty linear. And I would love to have some like bleeds and some washes of like black, like really, really rich towards the bottom. And then I think that could work very, very well. But this to me is one of your best pieces as far as just balancing the entire composition. Now this one, I know there is a narrative element. What I would say is ask yourself, what is the most important thing about this piece, which is called Requiem for My Cousin? And so we know from looking at this story that this is the ghost of your cousin. You're both playing this piece together on the piano. And one thing I like to do is I look at an image and I say, what is here that I could remove that I would not miss. Let's say the piano. Do you really need every single key on the piano to be rendered and drawn to that level of detail? My guess is no. I think you could probably have just a couple suggestions of the piano keys and let the rest just dissolve. Because I think what I see here is because you have the capability and because you are such a hard worker that you tend to go in and just over render everything. Whereas I think a better approach would be, say, to suggest something. Suggest that the piano is there, but don't show us every single key. Now, same thing with the faces. I know we think about people in terms of their faces. It is such a strong image. But the thing is, this piece to me is a lot more about playing the music. It's a lot more about your interaction with your cousin and the hands. I have to say, I don't even know that you need the bodies. I don't even know that this level of detail on this space is necessary because when I look at this piece, the first thing I go to is that face because it's really bright yellow, very saturated. It's got a lot of detail on the hair, but really if I boil it down to what this narrative is really about, it's about the hands, the interaction and the piano keys. The floor I think is not necessary just because it's there doesn't mean to draw it. Same thing with the piano bench. So this is a piece I might even say is worth you redoing. Do another version on it, but see how little you can do. Because in my mind, the way that you've done the piece and the way that it's titled, it feels like a very just quiet, moving, emotional moment that you're having with your cousin. And having an image like this that just sort of explains and spells out every single part of the story, it seems too coarse for such a lovely, delicate interaction. So I would try to think about that. And also stylistically, is this bright, heavy color with the yellow in the face, is that really working for this? Because it's a very somber image and it's a very touching image. But for me, at least that bright yellow doesn't really match that atmosphere that's in the piece right now. 
this is a beautifully done piece in terms of technique, but it looks very much like a copy of a photo. And so, yes, it shows a lot of technique and it's well composed, but I don't see as much of your voice in this piece. Like for sure, I see you here. I see you here. I definitely see you here. Like this has a lot of personality, but then when I go back and look at this, it's competently drawn, but I don't get a lot of personality. I don't feel you telling me a story through your voice. So you can certainly keep it. But I would say as far as really showing me who you are, which is a huge part of the portfolio process, this one does not tell me as much about you as an artist as some of the others do. And now this one, I think you need to start thinking more about the bigger elements instead of all the little hairs and the little licks of the flames. I think I would recommend really asking yourself, do you need that face? Is the face really the best way to convey this topic? I don't know the exact topic, but I will say that usually images that try to tackle big topics like climate change or some social commentary on a current event, usually the bigger the topic, the easier it is to fall into a cliche and a very generic image. Because here you have this figure, and I don't know why it has to be this specific person. I don't know what this person's relationship is with that animal, with the fire. And the thing is, the person's so nonspecific, like the shirt that they're wearing is this really nonspecific blue shirt. I don't know where they're from. So I would just say with stuff like this, you got to be careful that you don't end up skimming the surface of a topic that is so big that you you risk really making the subject so thin and shallow. It's sort of like if you wanted to do an illustration of the Civil War in the US. I mean, that's such a big topic. It's like a lot of people can't tackle that in one image. And so typically what you usually see with such a big topic like that is people will pick one person's experience, one particular story, one specific news article. That may be the case. I mean, maybe that was what you did, but it doesn't come across in the visuals. And I think it would be really good for you to think about how can I show this without a face? Because the face, that is for most people, the default reaction. Oh, if I want to show emotion, I need a face. If I want it to be about people, I need a face. You don't though. I don't think the face is as effective as a lot of people think. And sometimes things are much more powerful without a face. So this I think is one of your weaker pieces. I think for that reason, and also because of the lack of planning with the topography. And so I would recommend probably it would be more powerful if you took away the National Geographic reference, like cropped out the yellow, maybe colored over the text and have it just be an image. Because I think on top of the generic imagery and then you add the National Geographic topography, it makes it even more problematic. I think it'd be better if you wanted to explore topography, just do a new piece because there's too many fundamental problems with the way the topography has been put together. I'm going to guess that the text was added after the image was done. And that's always a big mistake. I think with topography, it's got to be there right from the get-go. Like if you're making thumbnail sketches, don't draw the thumbnails and then add the text later. The text has to be in the thumbnails. Topography is very hard. A lot of people underestimate just how much has to be considered. And so if you want to do another one, I would, and then I would really think about the font and the size and the color, get all that going in the text with the image. They have to work together. You can't just slap the text on last minute on top of the image and hope it's going to work. It rarely does. So I would recommend doing that because it's a great idea. I just think that you haven't thought through some of those finer parts of the piece. ArtProf does offer portfolio critiques that you can purchase. We review portfolios for students who are applying for BFA, post-baccalaureate, and MFA programs, and also independent artists. If you would like a critique on your illustration portfolio, on the figurative painting portfolio, whatever area you are in, we do do critiques in all of those areas, and you can select which staff artists you would like to critique your portfolio. 
We also offer artist calls that you can purchase. A lot of times, a lot of the advice that you're getting online is just not specific enough to your own circumstance. And so getting to speak one-on-one -on -one in a private call with myself or one of the teaching artists here at ArtProf can be a really great way to get a professional opinion on maybe a career decision, on what direction to take your work in. That is a great way to get customized support. And remember, we have a large section on BFA and MFA programs with portfolio critiques and articles and other advice on how to go about applying to art school on artprof.org. Lots of topics like should you go to art school, being an art school, student versus being an art major at a liberal arts university. And also on specific programs, like for example, the Richard D. Brown dual degree program. Art Prof has a podcast, it's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And subscribe to our channel, like this video, leave us a comment. And a big thank you to our top Patreon supporters who make it possible that Art Prof is 100% free and accessible to everybody. So everybody, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.